to bring together a group of remarkable people. To see if we could become something more. So when they needed us, we could fight the battles. That they never could. It's like to lose, to feel so desperately that you're right, yet to fail all the same. Dread it, run from it, destiny still arrives. Evacuate the city. And get our defenses. And get this man a shield. Fun isn't something one considers when balancing the universe. But this <laughs> does put a smile on my face. Good evening, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're watching this podcast from. Welcome to the Cockle Clock podcast. And Philip, no, Carl Simpson inside to put me wrong this time. <laughs> Not this time, no, no, no. Not this time. Now, tonight, Philip, it's a special podcast. We have a legend. Now, legend is usually banded around very easily, isn't it, Philip? But this man is. Is, a, is a legend of journalism of Tottenham of a generation that we need to cherish don't we we need the time at Spurs um I'm really excited about this so I'm gonna swap places with you because you're now become the host of the Cockrell Clock podcast Philip over to you to introduce our very very special guest thanks Thomas yeah THFC like that. We're, we're so proud to introduce this man uh, he's a legend, as Dermot said, in the world of sports journalism. He's the author of over 120 sports books over the years, 20 of which were co-written with the great Jimmy Greaves. This man has been a Spurs fan for 70 years. He's here to discuss his latest book, The G-Men, and to share with us his exper experiences with Spurs over the years. It gives us great pleasure to introduce the third G-Man, Norman Giller. Ah, good day, gentlemen. Uh, um, who's going to join us? I'm, I'm looking for whoever you've just introduced. Was that me? Yes. It was, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd just like to um, show you, gentlemen, how I start each day. Are you ready for this? Yes, yes, we are. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory. Hallelujah, and the Spurs go marching on. That's it, gentlemen. That's how I start each day. Isn't it sad? It's not. It's, it's, lovely. it's absolutely fantastic. That is a, what a way to start the day. What a way. You, well, Norman, everyone should start you, that day. Should start that with that song God. every yeah, day. Absolutely. Really absolutely. Do. Norman, again, I, I very, you're very little, welcome. I, can I say, I also have a little prayer that I always say to myself. Are you ready mm. for this? Yeah. yeah. Brown, Brown, Baker, Henry, Blanchflower, Norman, Mackay, J. 
Jones, White, Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know who, you know yeah. who's next? Who's yeah, next? they've doubled him. Les Allen. Les Allen and Terry yeah. Dyson. And of course, Jimmy joined them a year later. And, um, and I was very privileged to watch that team at its peak. What days oh, they were. Look, I mean, I've got man, nosebleed now man. because I've got nosebleed because we're at the top of the table. And um, But uh, back then, uh, we won the, the first 11 games of the season. So, uh, mm -hmm. so I'm quite used right. to it. I'm, I'm accustomed to these uh, <laughs> high flying, yeah. um, high anxiety days. Yeah, but the, Norman, just to bring you back to those days, right now, when you you were the sport leading the German, this chief sports writer on the on the Daily Express for years there, and could you openly declare your your support for Spurs then, or did you have to keep it quiet in the in the interest? No, of no, I, I came out. I, I came out of the closet um, when I um, be, became um, free of da daily reporting, because um, right. in in, the, in those days um, you you. You, you would try to be neutral. And um, so uh, I, w I went through my reporting career without people really knowing just how much in love I was with the Spurs team. But That, um, that must have been incredibly difficult at times. It, it was, particularly um, the Daily Express in those days was very much a, um, an Arsenal um, uh, <sighs> place that um, where the sports editor... Um, and uh, the, the chief columnist, uh, they were all Arsenal people. And oh, um, so, but I, I bit my tongue. And, um, but I, I had back then, we, we um, because we won so many things, I, I was able to hold my head up high. Right. Okay. Uh, I, right. I mean, I, I want to go back, Norman, to a dark time in our history when the year we went down, sadly. And, it got me thinking because there was no social media back then and we only got the news from the newspapers. Was there much fan anger towards the bat, towards the board like there is recently against Daniel Levy? What was it like around them days? Well, what, what, what you have to remember, you, you, we're, we're talking about the 70s, aren't we? When, yeah. When, uh, yeah. Well, uh, back, back, then, back then there wasn't social media. Mm. And so all the anger, we, we only heard it uh, on match days. But um, nowadays, of course, it's um, not non-stop. And um, Levy and Co. They 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 get hammered uh, right, left, and centre, twenty-four hours a day. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I I much prefer the, the days when we were able to be balanced. Mm. And uh, I mean, I, I despise all the hatred that is around now. Yeah. Uh, hatred in the world generally, unfortunately, mm. as we know. Yeah. But um, yeah. but I don't see why why people you know c can't just take things in their stride and and uh, su support the club for what it does and um, lead lead the politics to Mr. Levy and Co. Yeah. Let us yeah. let us concentrate on the football. And God, are we getting a treat at the moment? We really are. Aren't we? we really no. are. And you know, just to go back to the heady days of November 1961, when we signed Jimmy Greaves from AC Milan. Were you actually at White Hart Lane when he scored his hat trick on the debut against? Yes, against Blackpool, and, and, and including the scissors kick from a Dave McKay yeah. throw in, which was flicked onto yeah. Jimmy, and the, then then the scissors kick, and uh, we we talked. I mean, back 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 then, we we uh, didn't see it every five seconds on on Sky or anything. We used, we, but it kept us warm for for a whole, for a whole week mm. until until the following game. Yeah. But, I'd imagine, but, um, it must have been an amazing, amazing atmosphere that day. Like we just signed such a player and to, and to introduce himself with a hat trick, as he scored in all his debuts. But to score a hat trick like that must have been very hard to keep your 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 um, Spurs support quiet in your report of that it, match. I would say it, it it was, but I wasn't on the express then, so uh, I, I I wasn't getting oh, national right. oh, right. stuff. But um, I, I was on the paper called the Daily Herald. <laughs> which dates me? Do you remember the Daily Herald? Either? I've heard which, of which it. Yeah, I've into, heard of it. Heard well, of it, it morphed. It, it morphed into the Broadsheet Sun, mm -hmm. and then became. Uh, oh no! Whoops. The Herald, there which is a union paper founded by the trade union in 1929. Right. Mm. Okay. Right, right. Um, I just I want to go back again to the to the to early 60s because look, I. I 
I'm a massive history nut when it comes to Tottenham. I love everything Tottenham back to the 1800s, to the 1901 Cup final, to the 1921. I just eat all that history up because I just love Tottenham, always have done. Well, Dermot, I was... can I interrupt you there then? Yeah. And um, say, with this leg, the legacy shirts that we're getting, mm -hmm. um, why on earth didn't they make Bobby Buck Buckle number one and then put yeah, an asterisk and say, and say this the he Bobby is representing all the founder members. Yeah. I mean but, but without Bobby point. without Bobby back would there have been no Tottenham Hotspur. No. That's true. That's true. Good That's point. True. We did a show recently about that, didn't we, Philip, about the we formation did, yeah. of Tottenham yeah. man. Without the him, you're right. Not, but yeah, without him there would be no Spurs. But to go back to then to Jimmy Greaves, when he came back from AC Milan, I know the story that Bill Nick went over to Italy. Italy then didn't want AC Milan didn't want to sell Jimmy because they could, because of he didn't really want to be there, so I left him. Look, if you can find him, we sort of now and then. Because Bill Nick went searching for him and found him, brought him back to Tottenham. How come he never went back to Chelsea for the team that sold him to AC Milan? What was the thinking behind that? There's there's an old saying. I think Edmund Hillary may have been the man who said it. You don't count climbing Mount Everest twice. Jimmy had already mm -hmm. climbed the Chelsea mountain. And he wanted another challenge and he wanted to do it with what was then considered the best team seen in Britain for, for many, many years. And so he, he chose Chelsea, even uh, uh, Tottenham, even though he would have got more money by playing, going back to Chelsea. I mean, Joe, Joe, Joe Mears off, offered him, um, I think it was £80 a week, but he, he, wow. he took instead the £65 a week that uh, Tottenham were offering. And then there are bonuses on top, obviously. Yeah, wow. yeah. That's it's um, when you think of the money the players are on today, you know. I know I thought it was a lot, it was a lot of money in those days, but uh, it was a big yeah. far cry from the twenty pound a week maximum wage that Jimmy Hill got rid of in nineteen sixty, wasn't it? Yeah, so exactly. Even Eighty-five quid a week was a huge increase, you know. But um, and j just go yeah, back, you, uh, Nick. When Jimmy never earned hundred pound a week, you know. Jimmy did never he? earned hundred pound a week. Did no. he not? No. Oh my god. Was it was he it was true he 10 had ten years and he still didn't get up to hundred quid? Oh my God! Just yeah. when I say, was it true Jimmy had a job at Wimbledon Greyhound in the summer? Was that before um, Tottenham or but when he was no, at Tottenham? No, it was at Stamford Bridge. Um, he um, that they had a dog track at Stamford Bridge, and he, yeah. and, um, and he went there and also to Wimbledon. He, he lived in um, a clubhouse at Wimbledon, mm. and uh, he used to. Um, Mow the pitch and things, you know, to pay pay the rent, help pay the rent. Mm -hmm. That was when he was a, a, an eighteen year old kid. Wow. But uh, that, that was Plow Plow Lane. Do you remember Plow Lane? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and yeah. there was an Irishman and there was... called Ed, Eddie Eddie um, oh, well, Eddie Reynolds. Mm. Now, now there's a bit of trivia for you. The only man ever to head four goals at Wembley it was in a, an F, FA Cup amateur cup final. And he headed four goals for Wimbledon. Wow. Eddie Reynolds. Oh, boy. God. And he so and Jimmy used to live, live next door to each other. I remember Jimmy Grieve saying that in the show he did with um, uh, Bobby Moore, not Bobby Moore, uh, Brian Moore. He did a right. video and, about, and he was talking about that, the head he goes, that's incredible. It really that's is. Sorry, Philip. You, yeah, yeah. you yeah. made me emotional now. Brian was my best friend. I, I, I gave oh, Brian his, Moore was a brilliant commentator. He was a brilliant I gave commentator. His I gave his eulogy and um, come very quickly to tell you a story. It's got nothing to do with Tottenham, but I, I was still it anyway. Um, I, I gave, um, made a program called Brian called Over the Moon Brian, which mm. is all about his career. And um, we interviewed every, every major star at the time, including the likes of Bobby Charlton. And... Um, we, we finished up with uh, the master, uh, Brian Clough. And I was sitting in Brian's um, lounge up, up in Derbyshire. And um, in, in the same lounge, there's his, there's his lovely wife. There's Brian Clough, Brian Moore, and the director of the programme, Brian Klein, who, who later became Top Gear director. So I've got three mm -hmm. Brians talking. So you can imagine how confusing it was. <laughs> and Brian spent the whole evening playing a Sinatra uh, albums, and he was um, and he was uh, singing along with the albums. And uh, and what one of the songs is "You're the Top," "You're the Coliseum," 
and anyway, anyway, he he amused us for for a couple of hours. The, the yeah. next day, we did we did the interview on camera, and uh, without Brian Moore knowing, we we presented him with a um, cartoon that I'd arranged, and it was autographed by every major star you can think of. There was, there was Pele, Stanley Matthews, Tom Finney, every major star was around at the time. Signed, signed this, and um, but Brian Clough was going to secretly p- present it to Brian Moore. So Brian Moore was wrapping up the program, and um, suddenly from behind the hedge, Brian Clough comes carrying the cartoon, and he's singing, "You're the tops, you're the Coliseum," <laughs> and he sat on, and he sat on Brian Moore's lap, and he sang the whole the song all the way through, "You're the top." So spin forward about uh, 11 years dear i was watching the um england were playing uh, germany in munich I, I know i'm waffling but, but it's a good story uh, um england were playing germany in munich and um it was the one in which england won 5-1 oh. mm-hmm. when the fourth goal went in the phone rings and i'm thinking to my my son michael calling me you know uh, and, I'm, and I, I picked up the phone, yeah, hey, hey, hey. and it's Simon Moore, Brian Moore's son, mm. and it was John Motram was doing the commentary on the match, and it's Brian, so it's Simon Moore's ring, and he said, Norman, I'm terribly sorry, I have to tell you that uh, dad, dad has just died, mm. and he died oh. of a heart attack, and uh, so he died during that match against Germany. Oh, my God. Spin, spin forward another f- f- uh, f- five, five or five weeks and I was doing a eulogy for Brian Moore and uh, as as I'm giving the eulogy and the p- place was packed and it was being relayed outside outside the small church in Kent and I've looked down and there's these George Roby eyebrows that Brian Clough had mm. he's, he's developed yeah. and I've looked down and there's Cluffy and he, he has got out of his sick bed and he was desperately all the time to get to the funeral uh. and so I've, I've managed to add lib and you know Brian, it's so wonderful to see you, and 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 our Brian would would, would be thrilled. And after I finish eulogy and, and the service is over, Cluffy's coming. He said, "Hey, young man," he said, "That that was a beautiful eulogy, and I thoroughly enjoyed it." He said, "But if I'd have done it, I would have sung, you're the top, you're the Coliseum.'" <laughs> oh my God, that's a brilliant story. <laughs> So, oh. so I'm sorry about that, but you you mentioned Brian Moore and it yeah. immediately came sorry. to mind. Oh, no, that's I, I would, great. Just very quickly, Philip, sorry, I don't mean to, I know we've got, a, me and Philip have to sing one question. Brian Clough, I no. love Brian oh. Clough, right? I'm a Spurs man, Didn't but I love Brian yeah. Clough. I think Didn't he's, real. he is a Larger unique, than life. yeah, unique individual. Um, because everyone wants to watch Damned United and I don't think it's, it's true what really happened at Leeds. I don't really ever know. Was Brian Clough as, how can I put it? Was Brian Clough as unique as everyone, the stories you hear about him? Was he really like that in private as he was in public? I'm sure there was a different Brian Clough at home, a family man. I've I've been, been a very lucky man, and I've, I've met the likes of Muhammad Ali. I worked with Eric Morgan for nine years. Yeah. Um, so, I've, so I've met some great, great men, and mm. Cluffy is right up there. He, he 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 was larger than life, um, very arrogant. You have to say that he was an arrogant yeah. man, but that arrogance was so vital to his to to him because it, it was confidence that made him different to all the rest of us. Yeah, and I, I personally, I'd have had him running the country, and he was a good socialist as well. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I love Brian no. Clough. I mean, I mean, I'm a massive boxer nut, and. Philip said you were coming on. Muhammad Ali is one of my heroes. He really is. I mean, Ayrton Senna is my sporting hero, but Muhammad Ali, for what okay. he's done. Now, you it, see, I haven't, I haven't got a notebook near me. Yeah. This can all be edited out. Are you, are you ready for this? From the first yes. club champion, John L. Sullivan, right? Mm-hmm. Gentleman Jim Corbett, mm. Irish yeah. blood. Irish yeah. blood. Yeah. Bob Fitzsimmons. Yeah. Hit him in the slats, James J. Jeffries. Yes, that's right. Then he he retired and handed the mm. title to Marvin Hart, but, but he didn't really win it in the ring. 
so when Marvin Hart defended it against Tommy Burns, Tommy Burns mm -hmm. won. Tommy Burns' real name, Noah Busso from Canada. That's right. And uh, five foot nine. <laughs> Imagine if I'd in Titan Fury and he's five foot nine. So <laughs> so he, he, he runs all the way around the world trying to get away from there's this black giant called Jack Johnson. Yeah. Jack Johnson right. catches up with him in Sydney on, on Boxing Day nineteen oh eight and uh, the police stopped the fight in the eleventh round. And uh, so John L. Sullivan uh, John L. Sullivan, um Jack Johnson becomes yeah. champion. Jack Johnson loses it in Havana in Cuba. With the sun in his eyes, 26th round. Yeah. You've seen that picture where he's covering, yeah, I his, have. covering his face that... from the, to protect himself from the sun. Yeah. Was that Jack Dempsey that beat him? No, no. No, no it no, wasn't. No, 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 that was um, Willard, Jess, Jess Willard. Jesse the Willard, that's it, yeah. Will, yeah. Willard loses it to Jack Dempsey. Yeah. Jack Dempsey, for all his purse on winning the first round, knocks Willard down seven times, gets out of the ring, so he thinks he's won his money and he's called back in because the, the bell had gone and they couldn't hear it because of the row. Dempsey knocks him out in the third round, but he's, 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 he's lost all his money. So he did it for nothing. Oh, <laughs> so Dempsey, oh, anyway, he lost he, he lost to Gene, Gene Tunney. Gene, Gene, yeah. Gene Tunney with a fight in Marine and Battle of the Long Count in Chicago. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> I can I can bore for Britain. I tell yeah, I, I love all that. I love all that sort of boxing. That my dad was a massive boxing fan, and he brought me up on like on Ali Frazier, Foreman, yeah, Kenny you've got, Norton. You got to let me continue this because otherwise it will get stuck in. Oh, my carry, on, like, carry on, carry on, carry on, carry on. So so um, Gene Gene Tunney retires. Max Schmelin win, wins it. The only one to win it on the canvas gets a foul in the fourth round. Gets hit in the cobbler, just cobblers by um, uh, Jack Sharkey. Mm. In the return, Jack Sharkey wins. Jack, Jack Sharkey loses it to Primo Carnero in probably a fight that was fixed because the Mafia were running boxing then. Um, Primo Carnero loses it to Max Bear, and uh, they both go down in the eleventh round. And and uh, Max Bear says, um, "Last one, up, last one up, a, a sissy." <laughs> it's in the world who went title for him. Max Bear <laughs> wins. Max, Max Bear loses it to um, James J. Braddock, the Cinderella man. Braddock gives almost sells it to Joe, Joe Lewis and has ten percent of his purse for the rest of Joe Lewis' career. Joe, Joe Lewis, the champion, loses it to Ezra Charles. As a Charles loses it to Jersey Joe Walcott with a fantastic left hook. Jersey Joe Walcott loses to Rocky Marciano. And um, I had the pleasure of meeting Rocky four times. And um, Rocky uh, was... Um, it, I didn't meet him in the ring. <laughs> I met him for interviewing. <laughs> <laughs> and then so Rocky Marciano retires, Floyd Patterson wins the vacant title, loses it to Ingemaria Hansen, beats your Hansen in the return, then he fights the monster, Sonny Liston. Sonny Liston knocks him out twice in one round. Sonny Liston then nineteen sixty four loses it to young Cassius, young brash Cassius Clay. Then the stinking return in Maine, where where the shooting was last week. It's the only time the Maine's ever got any headlines. Is the world heavyweight title fight when he lost lost List and lost in the first round. It really a stinking decision. Yeah. So something like that was bent. And and then um Lewis and Maine last week there was the terrible shooting. Mm. It's the only time it's been in the headlines. Then mm. um so so we've um, now now got the young Cassius Clay becomes a Muhammad Ali, rules the world. Um he's he's kicked out Take, or has his title mm. taken away because he refused to fight the Viet Cong, and um, then it's uh, it finally gets up. Joe Fraser gets it. Joe Fraser is all ready to fight Ali again mm. after after the battle of the century, and um, but just before he fights him, he goes and fights uh, a young youngster, 1968 Olympic champion George Foreman. George Foreman bat batters him to defeat, as we know, in Jamaica. <laughs> this is terrible. Then, then Joe, Joe Frazier um, fights uh, the, the jungle. Um, Joe, Joe Frazier loses it to Foreman. Foreman, the, 
um, the, the jungle fight in Zaire against um, Muhammad Ali, who amazingly knocks him out in eighth round. Muhammad Ali relaxes, goes and fights Leon Spinks, a, a kid, and, and Spinks, Spinks beats him, <laughs> God knows how. Ali, Ali becomes the only man to win it three times while beat, beat, beating Spinks in return. And then the biggest, one of the biggest crimes that everybody involved should be put in prison. They put him in with Larry Holmes. Yeah. When, when, when um, Muhammad Ali should have long, long ago retired, and Holmes stopped him in 10 rounds and mm. cried because he'd, he'd beaten the, the master. Mm. And that, that, that's enough. Let's get back on the subject now. But I, I just want to show you, you mentioned boxing. I, I do love yeah. my boxing. I, I'm sitting Norman. there. That I'm sitting brilliant. there in absolute amazement. I've got one more question, Philip, then we will get back on to Tottenham. I'm Please, sorry. Can I tell you? Can I tell you? I can, I can also give you, with each World Heavyweight Champion, I'll give you who was Prime Minister, who was President, which sovereign oh, yes. reigned. I've got all these stupid oh, things but... in my head. Yeah. Um, I just got one question, Norman, and then, Philip, I'm sorry, I apologise. No, um, this, I, I'm no boxing fan, but I'm absolutely transfixed by did, that. Did you ever meet Murray Walker? Yeah, Murray, yeah, yeah, but, but, but don't, don't stop. You want me to do driving? No, <laughs> no, I, no, I, I, I grew up. <laughs> yeah, Murray, Murray was a right. gentleman. Yeah, he's a lovely I, man. Yeah, I, I, but, but that's a, that's a bit, bit of a change from boxing. Yeah, I mean, I love Formula One, but Murray Walker for me was the voice of my childhood yeah. growing up. He really was. That man would make two ants going up a wall sound interesting. He yeah. had that sort of, and it was the same with, with, I suppose, Bill Nick and Tottenham in the 60s. They sort of grabbed you, didn't they? That, that, what I'm saying about my walk with Tottenham in the 60s, they grabbed you by the scruff of the neck and said, yeah. right, come with us. We're going to do the double. We're going to be successful. And what was it like for the fans then? It got everyone, the whole Tottenham area excited, like what Bill Nick was building. Well, Bill built Bill, what, was, what was the Spurs family. Mm. Um, Arthur Rowe was too shy a man to do it, but Bill yeah. Bill was big enough to do it. And as Cliffy Jones always says, Bill Bill was the ran that club from the boot room to the ballroom, mm. and um, he he was in charge of ev every aspect of the game. And um, he 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 he'd never put up with Daniel Levy, for instance. It would was, have been extraordinary if Levy had gone along. You've disappeared, yeah. now. I'd be back in the safety system. Well, another thing, just to bring you back on to the, the I want to tell us about <laughs> tell us about the infamous Dave Mackay drinking school in the Bell and Hare. Oh dear, oh, how, how lucky was I? Dave used to say that there, there are two rules. He said number one, you're deaf to everything that is said here, and nothing appears yeah. in the newspaper. That's yeah, fine, Dave. He said more important. He said you get a fucking drink in. You get around in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I was just got that, that, and then coming the out. The most important was getting around in. Yeah, but, um, yeah. We, we oh, there must be some legendary bit... nights in that place after the games. Well, the, the um, that they used to have um, a, a bar at the back of the Bell and Hare, and and the and the governor of the Bell and Hare yeah. used to keep the the, the hoi polloi away, and so there were the players and a, and a few you know, press men were allowed in. And uh, we, oh well, we used to be legless, I'm afraid. I mean, there, there was a drinking culture in those days mm -hmm. that um, yeah. they don't do now. I mean, they all drink orange juice and things. <laughs> but it, you have to remember. How would Bill Nick have reacted to that? How would Bill Nick well, have reacted to that? Let me just say, it was pre breathalyzer yeah. pre And so um, yeah. mm -hmm. there, there was not that dis discipline. Um, Bill Nick um, used to think, used to say, that all players are adults, and he said it's up to them how they lead their lives. All I'm interested in is what they do in training and what they do on the pitch. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. prov provided they gave 100%, he turned a blind eye to their drinking habits. There, there was a mm -hmm. famous occasion when Alan Gilzean um, was called into Bill's office on one Monday morning, and Bill said, uh, Alan, he said, I've had, I've had a complaint from one of our supporters that uh, you were seen coming out of a nightclub at two o'clock in the morning. And Gilly said, oh, it's rubbish, absolute rubbish. He said, uh, I was going into that nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that summed up Gilly. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Oh, my God. 
I once asked her, Alan, I said, who, 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 are, you, who are your favourite um, partners, Alan? He said, uh, Bacardi and Coke. <laughs> I, was, I, was hoping, I was hoping you said Jimmy Green. So. Um, oh, look, look, I, well, look, I, I, Tottenham, of course, for me, for all of us, it's our lives. It's like a second family, aren't they, to us, Tottenham Hotspur? And I always like quoting Bill Nick quite a lot. Philip knows this. We go on to another fan show, a friend of ours, Dave, over the Irish Hots, but I'm always quoting Bill Nick and quoting stuff. He says, do you think the club, do you think the club used Bill Nick after he retired? Do you think they used him wisely? And why did it take it so long for the club to, why did it take Keith Birkinshaw to get Bill Nick back in? Well, we're, we're, we're talking club politi- yeah. politics here. When when Bill was um, he resigned, but I mean he was he was virtually sacked. Yeah. Um, the the Wales who were running the club at the time, um, they were p- preparing to bring in his successor. And Bill, thinking he was still in charge in the boot room and the ballroom, decided that he would offer the job to Danny Blanchard with Johnny Giles as his trainer. Now, you two Irishmen will know that yeah. they, they were two of the gods of the game. Den- so yeah. B- Bill has teed it up for Danny Blanchard, who was then working with me at the um, the Express newspapers. There's Danny Blanchard and Johnny Giles. The ball took umbrage to this, and um, they they thought, we've got to show Bill Nicholson that he's not running this club. And so they ignored Bill's advice, and they brought in a, a red-blooded gentleman called Terry Neal, another great Irishman. Lovely man, but no way was he right for that job. And Bill Nicholson knew yeah. that. And so we went into the dark times that you were mentioning earlier. And uh, then, of course, Keith Birkinshaw, who had come in as coach to Terry Neal, he, he took over and, and there were some golden years under Keith. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Was that... Just gone back a few years. Sorry, Philip, go on. No, no I was just going to say, I'm going to continue that story. Just gone back a few years... Uh, um, Unless your your story, your question is relating to Bill Nick there. Carry on. I'll, I'll go back in a minute. Yeah. I was just saying, when Keith brought back Bill Nick, did that help Keith during the tough times, the early years at Tottenham? Was he a great <laughs> sounding board? A bit like how Sir Alex Ferguson or Sir Matt Bosby or, or Bob Paisley was for Liverpool managers like for Kenny Douglas. What, what, what you have to remember is they, they were both very, very similar, like twin twin brothers, but they're both dour Yorkshiremen, mm. both Keith and Bill. And they talk the same language. Mm. Um, but let's give credit here to um, a gentleman who first um, started the, the Jewish element of, of the game, mm. was Irving Scholar. And he was the one, the main instigator of bringing Bill, Bill back from West Ham, where he was chief scout. And Bill came, came back and um, he and uh, he became uh, the scout. And among the, among his first signings was a gentleman called Gary Mabbott. And that, it was Bill Nicholson who brought Gary Mabbott to the club. Mm. And uh, Bill never, ever tried to interfere with Keith. And Keith appreciated that. And uh, he used to sit at Bill's feet, knowing that he was talking to somebody who was a walking encyclopedia on football. And he picked Bill's, Bill's brains. And... Uh, the football that the Spurs played under um, Keith was very similar to what Bill used to have when when he was in charge with 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 the team in, back back in the sixties, and it was they were always a passing team, which which Keith Birkinshaw made it a passing team, and uh, mm. Bill of course um, learned at the feet of Arthur Rowe, mm. when and Bill Nicholson was the the, the right half for that Spurs push and run team, which um, was, was Dick, Ditch, Burn, Ramsey, Alf Ramsey, but yeah. probably the, the next, I would say there's been one better right back than, than Alf Ramsey, and that was Walker. Um, wow. the, 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 the only mm. fall back yeah. I've seen better than Alf Ramsey was Walker. I, I would agree with that. I would, Kyle Walker, for me, was a brilliant right back for Tottenham. Oh. Really was fantastic. Well, what, what, what an athlete! You know, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I always, yeah. always imagined he could have run, run the four hundred meters for Britain. You know, yeah. he, he was, a, he was like a four hundred meter runner. Mm. He's a bit, a bit, bit like we see um, Jude Bellingham uh, play, mm. play. You know, a very upright player mm. and, and fast. And 
I'm, I love Bellingham, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good player. Yeah. Yeah. Just want to say well, uh, to anyone that's joining us, we've got our guest tonight is Norman Giller, the legendary journalist and author of 120 books, mainly about you can ball for Britain. sport, boxing. And all, <laughs> not all, uh, we are riveted by this, Norman. We're absolutely hanging on your every word here. And just you can see the, the uh, Norman's website is going across the bottom of the screen there. Uh, I want to go on the website and look at the array of books that he has for sale. This um, we're discussing in particular tonight is new book, The G Men. Uh, I'll bring it up, Philip. Jimmy Reeves and Alan Gilzine. We have the cover here now. Come on, Dermot. Quick, quick. <laughs> I can see me. Philip thinking, come on, Dermot, come on. <laughs> there the you go. These days, you know. oh, well, there, there you is. Look, one there they are, the two of them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's in, and then, and let, without, I'm not, I'm not being condescending or anyone to say that the man we have on the screen with us it was the third G man. Yeah. He was that yeah. close well, can I say, those guys. Even see the little headline at the top, it says one of football's greatest double acts. Mm. And don't forget, yeah. this was not only on the pitch, but also at the bar. They, they were oh, fantastic. Yeah. They were wonderful entertainment at the bar. Back, back in back in the yeah. days when footballers were drinkers. Yeah, uh, but I'll just go back to the 1965, um, Norman, around the time that Jimmy contracted hepatitis B and was out of the game for a number of weeks. Like, I suppose the timing was particularly bad there with the World Cup coming on and the fact that well, I think he lost a bit of pace maybe because of that illness. Was that the start, between that and missing out on the World Cup final, was that the start of Jimmy maybe falling out of love with the game? Um, well, no, he, he didn't fall out of love with the game then. Um, it, what, you have to remember, while he was lying in hospital and he was in there for five weeks with that, hep, that hepatitis, dear Morris Norman broke his leg playing against... Uh, a Hungarian national team were over here trying, uh, preparing for the World Cup in 66. Lovely Morris right. Norman broke his leg, so they were very bleak times. The previous year, we'd lost uh, John White, uh, dear John White, lo lost him to lightning. We lost uh, Danny Blanchard to, to a knee injury, so he retired. Mm -hmm. And um, Dave Mackay twice broke his leg. So they were very bleak, dark times. But, 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 uh, Rather than losing his appetite, Jimmy was determined to show the world that he, he could recover from his hepatitis. And he got himself fit in record time. And they said he, could, he couldn't train, but God did he train for, to, for, to play because he, he had his mindset on playing for England in the 66 World Cup. Because G Jimmy was yeah. one of the few people who was convinced that England was going to win that, that World, World Cup that, that, that year, mm. mainly because we had a fantastic defender called Robert Frederick Moore and um, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby yeah. Moore was the, the, the best defender I've ever seen and uh, yeah. but but yeah. Jimmy but Jimmy and was his best pal mm. and yeah. um, he, he'd made up his mind he's going to play for England got back into the squad against all odds mm. and um, in the third match against France in 66 um, he got he got hacked um, the, the French, the French um, defender who kicked him um, should have kicked Nobby Styles, but he was frightened of Nobby, and he thought Jimmy was an easier target. <laughs> Kick, kicked Jimmy in, yeah. in the in the um, in the shin, and uh, Jimmy picked up an injury. He had to have twelve mm. stitches in that injury. People didn't realise how bad it was. Mm. And um, when it came to the quarterfinals, Jeff Hurst went and scored the winning goal against Argentina, and uh, Jimmy, Jimmy's looking on helplessly from the sidelines. Then the semi-final, the best game of the tournament, that England beat Portugal 2-2-1 two, two, mm. with oh, Bobby yeah. Charlton scoring two fantastic mm. goals. And um, Jimmy knew from that moment on that he had no chance because there was an old adage, and Alf Ramsey believed in it, don't change a winning team. Yeah. And so Alf yeah. named an unchanged team and he, he never, ever dropped Jimmy. He just didn't pick him again after he'd been injured. Yeah. He didn't drop him. And is it correct? Isn't it correct to say that it was many years afterwards when the FA or the World that FIFA finally gave Jimmy a winner's medal? It, it was, he didn't uh, get one well, of uh, I think it was 18 years later. It was ridiculous. And, and, and Jimmy showed his contempt for it by uh, selling an auction for £40,000 about a month later. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> but but, but Jim, oh Jim, Jimmy... Jim, Jim, Jimmy uh, was a very proud man, and uh, in, in the, I mean, he, he loved receiving the medal, but 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 it, it, it wasn't his idea. He wanted to be in that team and and, and win it properly. Mm. 
Right, right. And yeah, just one, one more question just around that time. I'm going to derma back in there. Um, did you actually cover the third round FA Cup game in 1967 between Millwall and Spurs when there was a, a rather unusual the, occurrence to place on the halfway line? At, well, so well, at, at, this, is, this is before the kickoff at the Den, you mean? One mm, of the Den. Yeah, yeah at the Den, met. yeah, the one at the Den, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> my, my, I come from a family of Dockers, so, so I know the Millwall have Dockers as their fans. And I mean, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're white more than back then they were really wild and um we're all waiting for the kickoff and suddenly two supporters have come r running up to the center circle and they've got a cockerel and they've sa they sacrificed the co cut the co cockerel's throat <laughs> on the center circle <laughs> and and, 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 and gilly Gilly, told, Gilly um, um, had been told by had been warned by jimmy he said it's like going to the bloody gorbals he said what yeah. He said, no, he said, well, it can't be that bad. He said, he said oh, you, you wait until you get there. And Gilly said, well, I've never seen that before. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they, they killed a cockerel in the, in the middle of the pitch. And, and they got a draw oh, that dear, night. Oh, they got yeah, a draw. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, the re, and, the re, and the replay, um, the, the Spurs, Spurs won it, of course, mm. because they went on to win the cup. But uh, but uh, then... They, Nobody who ever saw it ever forgot that the, the, the way the Spurs um, or the Millwall supporters uh, sacrificed his cough for I me. Mean, I don't think yeah. he's ever been done think... before or since. No, I think, Dermot, you've got the question of a Dave Mackay in the 1967 I, FA Cup. I, I, I have, well, you? yeah, I, I do. Um, can you kind of what really happened during that game against Bristol City? Because did Dave <laughs> Mackay refuse to go on after yeah. the ref sent go off after the ref sent him off? He 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 got tackled by another jock called uh, I think it's Bobby Kellogg, yeah. and um, and and, and uh, Dave's retaliated and, and whacked whacked Kellogg back, and uh, the referees come across and he and he, and he said in those days it was before the cards, so he did it verbally. He said, "Off, Mackay, off," and Dave, and Dave stood his ground, pretending he couldn't hear him because of the roar of the crowd, and. Um, He's got a hold of Bobby Kellogg and he's uh, frog marched him to uh, the referee. And Kellogg had said, that he said, I kicked him first. <laughs> and so the referee swallowed it <laughs> and just booked him. And uh, those are you, he wrote his name down in the book. And, and Dave, Dave, Dave had a good laugh about, about it later. Oh, dear, oh, dear. But he was definitely sent off. Away with that today. And yeah, what you have to remember, yeah. Dave, Dave was infamous as a strong man. I mean, mm. he, he was the greatest number six I've ever saw in my life and um, he he um, was known for, for his hard tackle but he would never ever sent off but I have to point out in those days he had to almost murder somebody to, to get to get um, to <laughs> get sent to an early, early shower he wouldn't, allow, he wouldn't last 10 minutes in today's oh, climate no, yeah. I don't think you know yeah. yeah, but no, another thing, um, moving on to yeah. another year of uh, the before 1968, uh, it was kind of the changing of the guard at Spurs when Martin Chivers arrived. Did that really right. was that the beginning of the end of the G Men partnership? No, well, no, this, this this was Bill Nicholson showing um, that he was a little bit old fashioned in his, in his approach to the game, and much you, you always had a, a mus muscular centre forward. Because Bill Bill had Ted Ditchburn, mm. uh, Ted Ditchburn, uh, Len Dukeman in playing centre forward for the push and run team. So they they, all, they always had muscle, mm. and uh, he'd watch this young kid um, growing up on the south coast playing for Southampton, and um, he thought now he would be the ideal foil for for Jimmy and Gilly, and mm. so he he brought him in to play in the number nine shirt with Jimmy and Gilly either side of him. Um, sadly, uh, Martin, um, who it cost 125,000 pounds, which is then, a, which, which included Frank Saul. Mm -hmm. That that was a record, British record at the time. And um, Bill Nicholson wanted to see how it would work with the three of them. But unfortunately, the, uh, Martin Chivers got um, a, a terrible knee injury. I mean, it was against Forest, I seem to remember, and he and he went down and, and he couldn't get up, and uh, he, he put him out of the game for nine months. His, his knee just locked, and mm -hmm. um, and so he went back to Gilly and uh, 
Greaves then. Mm. But before that, it had been um, Bobby Smith and Greaves, which had been a wonder. And this is why Bill wanted to try a muscular player, because yeah. there's nobody more muscular than Bobby Smith, mm. who was a real battering ram of a centre forward, yeah. real, real old style. And um, but Gilly and um, Greavesy, they, 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 as I once wrote, mm. um, Gilly was like the um, Rudolf Nureyev on grass playing a part de deux with Jimmy Greaves. Mm. And um, I, I wrote this in the Daily Express and Alan Gill's in was an express reader and, he, and I, I knew he'd have an opinion on it. And he said, Norman, he said, you do write right, write right a load of shite. He said, <laughs> he, he said it's a game of football. <laughs> no, 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 you know, you, all, all your fair, fairy tales you write. <laughs> so he, he wasn't oh, impressed by my, by, my, by my metaphor. But he really was a Nuria mm -hmm. on grass. I mean, he's like, like a ballerina. It was fantastic to watch the two of them together. Mm -hmm. And be, be, yeah. before that, did, mm -hmm. it, when Bill got rid of Bobby Smith, with whom he couldn't get on at all, because Bob, Bobby was a gambler and completely against all, all the morals that um, Bill Nichols had, um, it, it, anyway, um, he brought in Laurie Brown from uh, Arsenal. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Laurie was a, a great um, amateur centre forward who won a, an Olympic medal with, with, with the Great Britain team but as Jimmy said he was an am amateur on the pitch as well <laughs> you know he, 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 he just was not in Jimmy's class mm. and uh, so that that's when it, when Bill Nicholson decided he had to mm. buy Alan Gill's in yeah. and so, with, what, what, a par what a partnership yeah with yeah. all the legends yeah. that have gone on Tottenham since Jimmy Greaves and Alan, Alan Gill's in and all the players around the world all the partnerships we've had, like Maradona or Zico and Pele and Georgie Best, where would you put Alan Gilzine and Jimmy Greaves in that bracket against them world class? Players? Right. Um, this, this is off the top of my head because mm. I'm sure to miss somebody. But the best partnership I ever saw was Alfredo Di Stefano and Frank Pushkus for Real Madrid mm -hmm. in the fifties into the sixties. Mm. That they they were the creme de la creme. Yeah. Then after those two, I would put I would put Jimmy and Gilly nearly as high as them. I can't give them higher praise than that. But That's um, incredible, it is. But but as as British partnerships mm. go, um, there, there there was the, the trio at Man United, uh, Law, Best, and Charlton. They, they were fantastic yeah. together. I mean, but I, mm. I don't know how old you two, two gentlemen are, but how lucky was I to to see all these players at their peak. No, well, um, I, I yeah. saw Stanley Matthews and Tom Finney. You know what? Yeah. What footballers we had though back then. I, I I love talking to Philip because Philip, I'm a bit younger than Philip, and so I'm more the '80s and more Glenn Hoddle and Stevie Perriman and Grath Crooks and Steve Archibald. And I know me and Philip have a bit of laugh about Philip being sporting Tottenham a bit longer than me, but I love yes. diving into Philip's brain. Because I could say to him, Philip, what was it like in the early 70s or the late 60s? And Philip like, would tell me this, what it was like then. Don't. And I'm sitting there sort of in awe of him, like I'm in awe of you, of the knowledge and what you're saying. I'm just thinking, how lucky were you two to see yeah. like Georgie Best and Jimmy Greaves, Alan Gilzine, Bobby Charlton, Dennis Law, um, Billy Bremier at Leeds. You had Jack Charlton at Leeds. You had... Kevin Keegan at Liverpool with Steve Highway and Emlyn Hughes and Ray Clements. And, and I thought I was lucky, but I'm so jealous of you two seeing all them legends. And you should be prime. jealous. Um, but, Philip, yeah. Philip, Philip, they're lucky. I mean, there, there was a midfield trio at Tottenham. Mm. Danny Blanchard, Irishman. Yeah. John White, John, wonderful yeah. John White, yeah. yeah. Dave Mackay. Uh, what, who, what would they fetch today? What would they fetch today? I mean, today? you dug that, that three today. Well, 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 they're, they're, you, you're talking two hundred million to each. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but, but I was lucky uh, enough. I was, I was lucky enough. Um, I saw, uh, I saw both Jimmy Greaves and Alan Gazine playing. But for I was living, I was living in England at the time. I was going to school there. I lived in Birmingham, yeah, which means the only times I got to see Spurs play when they came to Villa Park, the Hawthorns. Uh, the St Andrews and possibly Molyneux, which is a bit further out. And the only problem with Spurs at that stage were they were brilliant at home, but the away record wasn't great. 
So I probably saw them lose more matches than they won. But it was still such an honour to see those players playing, you know. Yes, um, this, if, if there's one question mark about Jim, Jimmy, it was um, given 100% away from home. He, he, didn't, mm. he didn't always, Jimmy. You know, if he, if he yeah. didn't fancy it, he'd, he'd disappear from games. But that, that was away well, from home. He, he always gave 100% at White Hart Lane. I saw one game now, it always sticks in my mind. It'd be about 1968, maybe, and at the Hawthorns. And West Brom at the time, as they were one to do to a lot of things, were battering Spurs. West Ham had a, West Brom had a good team at the time with um what's his name? Um Jeff Astle. Uh, Jeff Astle, yeah. And uh man, what's it called? Tony something or other Tony. Anyway, I can't remember. But anyway, Jimmy Greaves had done nothing the whole game. He was literally Tony standing Brown. on the halfway line, literally Tony scratching Brown. his arse to mm. Tony Brown, yeah, doing nothing. I think Pat Jennings then got the ball and Pat did one of his overarm throws. And West Brom had only left one centre back back because this is the 89th minute. They were pressing for a win, I think, you know. Jimmy was off like a shot, round the keeper, back of the net, 1 0 to Spurs. He did nothing else the whole game. <laughs> but that was enough, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, what, what, one on one, J J Jimmy was the greatest of all time. I, mean, I never, ever, ever saw him not, not go round a goalkeeper. Goal, goalkeepers yeah. were, were always confused by him. You know, yeah, Peter, yeah, Peter yeah, Shilton, I was, I was with, with Peter fairly yeah. recently and he, he was saying that the best player he ever played against was Jimmy Greaves. And he said he scored a goal Jimmy, against me. Go and Jimmy scored his greatest ever goal against Peter Shilton? Against, against yeah, Leicester, which, mm. which was, um, it was not shown on television at all. There, was, there wasn't a camera, camera in the ground. I'm driving to the ground and uh, I got involved in, in an altercation with another motorist and uh, I had to change insurance details and things and as i'm running up the stairs the crowd start roaring and as i've got to the top of the stairs they're applauding non-stop for five minutes and it's jimmy oh. trundling back to the center circle and I'd, I'd missed the greatest goal i always describe it as the greatest goal i've never seen but um oh dear. but but but, 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 but uh, peter shilton said it was it was the greatest goal ever scored against him which is a, yeah. a, a great compliment I, I, just got one question. I'm sorry, Philip. I'm going sort of off topic of your questions. No, I'm just it's fine. So... We're, 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 this is we only the guidelines. We just we got that we could end up talking about anything on this. You know, I, I did. I I just I'm so enjoying this. Um, I'm I'm a great history in the football of 70s and 80s football. I love it. Philip knows that, and we show golden games on here of Tottenham in the past. How did Bill Nick stand up to the other great managers of that decade of Sir Matt Busby, Bob Paisley? Bill well, Shankly. Let, let me say that there were different animals to what we have mm. today. For, for a start, yeah. um, the, the greatest of the managers were Sir Matt Busby, Stan yeah. Cullis, Bill Shankly, Bill Nicholson. Mm. And all four of those gentlemen, what, how did they watch a game? They sat up in the stands, so they got an overview of, of the pitch. And they, they, they mm. were never, or very rarely, used to be on the touchline. And, uh, but now they, they, they're down on the touchline, the cameras on them, and they're playing to the camera instead of, you know, thinking thinking of the game, and they can't see the can't see the action properly from where they are. None, none of none of them can. I mean, if they had a real choice, they they would sit sit up and get an overview of the pitch, which is what the likes mm. of Bill Nicholson and Stan Cullis did, you know, and the, and that that that's a ma major difference in the game. And they didn't wear track suits; they used to wear their their proper suits and. Uh, yeah. And and sit, sit sit up in the stand and watch, mm. and and make notes from from up in the, and never never playing to the camera. Um, for, for they're watching games on did. TV. They're watching, they're watching TV on monitors at that side of the pitch now. Mm. You often see yeah. them looking oh, at yeah. the monitor and something. Oh happens. yeah, no, they, 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 but they have the sort of iPad I'm looking at now. You know, they they have iPads and uh, mm. and they're real te te technical guys. Look, you know, give giving them instant replays and. I, yeah, I've got one yeah. question. Going back to the 67 Charity Shield, where, of course, Pat Jennings scored that amazing goal oh, against yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Stepney, I think, the uh, Old Trafford. What did Jimmy Greaves say about that afterwards? Was he was he amazed? What was his comment to Pat Jennings <laughs> no, after he, that game? He, he turned to Pat, Pat Jennings, and as, as it happened, turned to Gilly and said, he said, do you realise this make, makes Pat our fucking good, good, uh, leading goal scorer? He'll never let us forget it. <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, it was such a freak thing. I mean, there yeah. was, it was blowing the gale there. The, the, the wind's got hold of the ball. 
And Alex yeah. Stepney, who one of the great goalkeepers, he's, he's, he's jumped up and failed to get it and the ball's gone straight into the net. And everybody's wondering who scored it. And there's, there's Jen, Jennings doing the jig on, on, in, in his oh, penalty area. They, they were big games oh, back then, yeah. weren't they? Tottenham, um, United and all that. Oh, they were legendary games back oh, then, weren't wonderful they? Game. As, yeah. as, as I said, yeah. they had best Lawn Charlton and, yeah. and Paddy, Paddy Kerr and, yeah. and, and uh, Ryan Harv, no, Nobby Styles. God, dear, what, what teams they were. We, me and Philip always talk yeah. about football and we were talk a lot about Man United. We did the Premier League review today and we're talking about Manchester United and what's happening to them. And we both say we're very sad what's happening to them. Um, do you think um, fans, owners that come in now, should they look at the past and take charge of what's happening, especially like with Tottenham and Manchester United who have rich histories of doing great things in the 60s and 70s? And do, do many people take that for granted? Yeah, yes, but what, what, what you have to remember is that, that football goes in cycles, always has mm -hmm. and always will do. It'll come around for Man United very soon. Don't worry. They've, they've got enormous resources. And uh, United will come again. I mean, it just happens that City have, because of Arab money, they've, they've, they've got one of the uh, the greatest squad mm. of players. I mean, they're, they're, their third team could probably win the Premiership. Premiership. And it's... Mm. Um, but but I, I, I'm a great believer in football being in cycles. And Man United will come again. As Spurs mm -hmm. are going to come again. No, don't get. We're, yeah. We've been in the wilderness for a long while yeah. when it comes to winning no. trophies, but we're, we're 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 getting there. I mean, I think Ange will uh, be taking a trophy home to Australia to show off very soon. Yeah. Very soon. Right. <laughs> Just one question, then, Philip. I'll pass sorry to you. Is Ange the reincarnation of Bill Nick? Because that's me and Philip have both said it. It's like the, it's reincarnation of Arthur Rowe and Bill Nick. Can, 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 into I, one. can I give you some boring history? Yeah. Are you ready yeah, for this? Yeah, fire away. Yeah, yeah, fire right. away. Arthur Rowe, who, who I, luckily I've got mm. to know very well, is a, is a lovely gentleman. But as I say, he's a very shy man. Arthur Rowe, before the war, he played played for England uh, centre-half, mm. got, got a knee injury, so he had to qu quit early, and became a coach. And um, he went out to Hungary and was coaching. Mm. And just in 1939... He was all set to become hungry manager, and by then he had started showing them the Peter McWilliam way of playing football. Mm. Peter McWilliam was Spurs manager twice, just after mm. uh, uh, before the First World War, and then just before the Second World War. P Peter was called um, Peter Peter the Great at uh, Newcastle because he, he was a great a great um, Jim Baxter type player with a wonderful left foot, and they, they called it the Wand. And he was Peter the Great, and they, they loved him up at Newcastle as a player. Came down to um, manage Spurs. Ar Arthur Rowe picked his brains, learned how to play football on the ground, which is the Scottish way of playing football. Because they're all, all short people, they 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 they, they um, managed to sh uh, make a, a great thing of always playing the ball to feet, never to head, or to heed, as they say. Arthur went out to um, Australia, uh, Australia to Hungary, t t passed on the seeds of what Peter McWilliam had told him. And among the young youngsters who learnt to play this ground game of football was a gentleman called Frank Pushkus. Rolled, rolled the years forward, Frank Pushkus, um, at the end of his career with Real Madrid, to, he managed about 14 clubs. And one of the clubs he managed right near the end of his career was called South Melbourne. And his left back is a gentleman called Ange, and Ang, Angelus Potigulo. And Ang, oh, Angelus, lovely. Frank Pushus couldn't speak English, for, but he'd spent a lot of time with Panathinaikos in in, in Athens, in so he could speak Greek. So who's his interpreter? Ange. So Ange is being taught by Frank Pushko. So and Ange was captain of South Melbourne. And Ange is being taught how to play play the game, the Fr Frank Pushko's way. And where did Frank Pushko get it from? Arthur Rowe. 
It's come full circle. It's come full circle. There's names yeah. just come round from Celtic, where he was a genius at Celtic. You know, talk talk to any Celtic fan, and they will say he's the best man, manager they've had since Jock Steen. Comes yeah. comes to um, Spurs. What's he doing? Playing <laughs> playing Arthur Rose push and run, and that's and that's what we're seeing now. And it, and it is push yeah. and run, isn't it? It's a, yeah. it's wonderful, wonderful stuff to watch, and never negative. Mm. Ne you know, that's the one thing about Bill Nicholson and um, Keith Birkinshaw, M Mauricio, when he, when he, when he, when he's at his peak. They never played negative football, and, and then we had Conte and uh, Marino playing that bloody defensive stuff. And uh, but now we're we're over that, thank goodness. It's like getting over right. a disease. And we, when we're now huh. fit and healthy and playing on the front foot, and long may it run up at last. <laughs> Sorry. Just one thing, though, uh, Norman. I mean, this is uh, apart from your books now, which are I've read a good few and they're brilliant about Spurs. The one I always rate is the Hunter Davis book, The Glory Game. Oh, how did he manage to get access back in the day? Oh. I was with Hunter um, fairly recently, but we were both guests at, of, of honour at the uh, White Hart Lane. And uh, I, I got him quietly on his own. And what we have to remember is Hunt, Hunter's not a, f a football fan as much as the uh, three of us are. He's, he's, he's more a man who's into his literature and a uh, wonderful writer. I mean, he was the first biographer of the um, Beatles official biographer and um i said to him hunter you know you you, you didn't know bill nicholson like i knew him and how the hell did you get into the dressing room i said i said i've, I've, I've wanted to do that for years and, and, and to bill the, the dressing room was always like a woman's boudoir you know press certainly weren't allowed in there and he said he said well he said uh, he and the sydney whale weren't talking to each other he said and uh, they didn't like each other he said, and I said to Sidney Wells, I said, uh, uh, Mr. Nicholson's given me permission to um, spend the season with you. And Sidney Wells said, what? He said, yeah, he said, uh, he said I'm going to go on the coaches and things. So he, so he got Sidney Well to, to agree to that. Then he went to Bill Nicholson and he said, Bill, he said, I've uh, been talking to um, the chairman and he wants me to uh, write about the club. He said, and he wants, he wants me to, to, to look at the background and uh, be with you on match days and in the dressing room. And Bill said, oh, well, all right, if the chairman says so. And so Hunter conned both Sidney Whale and <laughs> Bill Nicholson into thinking each up, each one was their idea. And, uh, and oh, he got boy. away with it. B B B Hunter how did the players said, react? How did the players react? But the, uh, I mean, Gilly hated it. Gilly said it was disgraceful that uh, he said you had to watch your tongue all the time and what you were saying, and um, right. and Eddie Bailey in particular, who was a, like like a, a wonderful, you know, probably Tottenham's one of Tottenham's greatest ever servants. Mm -hmm. You know, people forget it. without Eddie Bailey, we, we wouldn't have had the push and run team mm -hmm. because he could pass the ball on on a handkerchief from thirty yards. He was an incredible footballer, but um, mm -hmm. he was an Alf guy. He was a you know, I think Johnny Spate, who created Alf Garnet, I'm sure he must have met Eddie Bailey because Eddie Bailey was <laughs> Alf Garnet. He's a real, yeah, real, yeah. Cockney, real Cockney geezer. Mm. And um, he he was beautifully, because um, Hunter is such a brilliant writer, Hunter captured him perfectly. And he's come out of the book as a lot like, like Alf Garnet. And uh, so Eddie, Eddie Bailey, hey, he, he wanted to sue her. Uh, um now poor old um, may the both rest in peace jimmy and alan gonzale passed away in the last few years well a little while ago for alan goes in uh were you in touch with alan in his final years in the later years of his life yes um but when um the, the rumors went shot around that um mm. he'd become a beach bum and um was destitute but we, we think that was planted on the internet by an Arsenal fan because there was never any, mm. any truth in it. But he was living in Western Supermare and uh, he was the transport manager for a company who had had their business in Stevenage mm. and then in Chingford. Then they moved down to Bristol. Alan moved with them and he disappeared from sight. 
and, and all the stories whipped around that, that uh, he'd, he'd become a, a down and out. But there was nothing further than the truth. He was a very intelligent man and he just didn't want to get involved in in all the hoopla that mm. accompanies football. And he, he, he never, ever boasted. His next boast would, be, would have been his first. And uh, nice. so he's he's down in Supermare minding his own business. And then somebody wrote a book. Um, this is, uh, it was uh, somebody called Morgan. I forgot mm. his cushion name. And he, he wrote a book about the disappearance of Alan Gildeen. And Alan Gildeen was said, there's one thing wrong, he said, with that book. He said, I always knew where I was. <laughs> he said, I was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. so... so Steve Perryman and Pat Jennings got to hear about it, and um, Pat Pat uh, had a, a, a golfing pal who got a message to to Gilly to come back into the fold, and by then G Gilly was a, a master of football both north of the border and south of the border. He's one of the few players, as Kenny Dalglish was the other one, mm -hmm. who scored a hundred goals in the Scottish League and 100 goals in the English League, which wow. is fantastic. And um, so Dun Dundee was first to uncover him and, and start giving him the, the credit he deserved for his incredible career. Then Pat Jennings and... Um, Pat Jennings and... It's gone. Oh, Stevie Perriman. They, okay. they, 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 they worked on him and, uh, and they got him back into the fold with, with Spurs. And Paul Coit, you know, Coity, who mm. does the, the yeah. half-time mm -hmm. microphone work, he said he'd never, he'd never known a reception like Alan Gill's in got when he introduced G Gilly to the fans at half-time. He said, he said yeah. I was fighting, fighting not to cry on the, the microphone. Mm. You know, and, 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 and Gilly was overwhelmed by the reception mm. he got. Mm. And from then on, uh, Look, he, he got involved with the legends at the club. And uh, mm. he came back, and then the Steve Perriman said, how, how do we get him back with Greavesy? They've, they've not seen each other for more than 30 years. And uh, he found out that Alan Gilsey was appearing in Guernsey at, at um, a supporters club mm. uh, meeting in, in Guernsey. And uh, secretly, he arranged for J Jimmy to accompany him to Guernsey. And... Uh, just by coincidence, the, the, the two taxis taken them from the airport. J Jimmy had flown in from South End, and Gilly from Bristol, and the, the two taxis arrived from the airport at the same time at the hotel where, where the uh, evening um, concert was. Mm -hmm. Not concert, um, where the evening what what they called reception was. Yeah, and uh, they both got out of their taxis as if choreographed, and, and Steve said it was. He said, "I took a photograph of it, a still for which appears in the book, a photo of the me yeah. meeting for the first yeah. time." Thirty two. Yeah. He said, and "They fell into each other's arms," and Greasy, um, Greasy said, "Gilly, Gilly, where have you been?" And Gilly said, uh, "Staying away from people like you." <laughs> 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 and, uh, and and they were back oh. to their old banter because mm. they they were always bantering with each other, and uh, and it was as though they'd been together every, every minute. And people said, well, oh, you know, why, why did you leave it so long? And Jimmy said, we were, too, we were both busy living our lives. And, mm -hmm. you know, and Jimmy was as casual as that about it. Yeah. But, so, you know, just to move on to Jimmy there, I know we're all here, the very serious stroke in 2015. Now, just a slightly more serious topic, Norman. I know you're a great supporter of the Tottenham Tribute Trust. Can you just yeah. tell us about the great work they do with our former players? Well, the, the, the Trust... Um, they they um, look after the old heroes. I, I call them the, the old heroes and Mr. Gravy Train. People forget that there was football before the Premier League. Mm. And it was only when the Premier League came in that footballers started earning this monster money. The, the players who played under Keith Bergenshaw, so they, they they earned good money, but but never enough money to to retire, mm. to retire on things. And so the the Totten Trust helped those players who hit hard times and. I, I don't know a footballer who has not got something wrong with them. They're, they're either, every, every, every time I meet the old players, mm -hmm. they're either limping or they've got dementia. I mean, it, it, it's, it's terrible to see it. 
and, and the tribute trust help pay for their operations, med, med, medical help. And I give a don- donation from every book that I sell through me to, mm. to the tribute trust. And, and I, I don't have a halo because I, I, I do it because of the pleasure that those gentlemen gave me yeah. in the summertime in their lives. Now, in the winter of their discontent, they deserve any help we can give them. Yeah. So I think everyone should, yeah. uh, you know, if you go on and buy a book from Norman's website, there will be a donation made to the mm. Tribute Trust. And it's, it's great work. I mean, we seem to take for granted the footballers today on huge money and they're financially set up for life. I mean, the fact that Jimmy Greaves never earned 100 quid a week in his life has absolutely knocked me Amazing. for six. Yeah. Really, you know, you really. see what some of the guys are doing. Now, Norman, but we're I, going to wrap this up fairly shortly. Dermot probably just has another question there for you. I have one more question, and this is going back to my childhood, Norman, watching Saints and Greavesy. Now, I grew up on Saints and Greavesy. I didn't know who Jimmy Greaves was until I saw him on the telly. And then as I was getting older, I started knowing who Jimmy Greaves was. Now, I, my father wasn't the biggest Tottenham, wasn't the biggest sports fan in the world, so I had to find this all out for myself. But Saints and Greavesy, for me, was the best thing on a Saturday morning or Saturday lunchtime before the before all the games on the Saturday. Um, what role did you play in, in Jimmy reinventing himself and getting into Saints and Greavesy? Well, what we have to remember is, is when Jimmy went to West Ham, mm. um, it, it got involved in the World Cup rally and um, yeah. suddenly rally driving took mm. all his concentration. He lost interest in football. Mm. Yeah, the business he was running, employing 30 people, had a million pound over t- uh, turnover, which is a lot of money in those days. And um, and Bill Nicholson knew that he had l- lost his interest in football. The, the, the man, man on the terraces didn't know didn't know that, that Jimmy no no longer loved football. So when the chance came for Bill Nicholson to sign Martin Peters, this is in March 1970. Uh, he it's on deadline transfer deadline day. He he rang Jimmy at home. He said, uh, "Jimmy's <coughs> Jimmy." He said, "I've, I've got um, Martin Peters in the office." He said, "I want you to go and see uh, Ron Greenwood." And uh, and Jimmy, it was the day that Jimmy was moving house, and he was surrounded by packing cases, and the uh, people, all the removal men moving around him, and he's got one finger in his ear. And he said. Uh, are you sure, Bill? Is that what you want? And Bill said, yes. He said, go, go and see Ron Greenwood. And um, Jimmy said, OK. He said, I'll put the phone down. He said, I'm not thinking straight. And I've spoken to Irene, that's his beautiful wife. And uh, Irene said, well, look, Chadwell Heath, the training girl for West Ham, is only down the road. Uh, it's going to lead to an easier life for you. <coughs> you can concentrate on your business. And so Jimmy... Um, reluctantly went and signed for West Ham. <coughs> he scored two goals in his debut against Manchester City at, at Main Road. And uh, then he and Bobby Moore be- became a couple of drunks. I, don't, don't, I won't miss about. <laughs> there were a couple of drunks. And uh, they had a night out at... Um, Blackpool on, on the eve of a game at Blackpool and uh, they were seen by a supporter in, in the nightclub and they thought the match was going to be called off because it, it was iced over and anyway, the game was played West Ham were beaten 5-5-1 I think it was a lovely little player called Tony Green playing for Blackpool scored a hat-trick and um that following Monday, a supporter rang Ron Greenwood and said, uh, "He said you, you, your your two um, greatest players. He said they were in the nightclub uh, at midnight, and um, Ron, Ron called them in and they said they were because they'd, they'd heard that the match was being called off, and then they knew it was unprofessional what they'd done. But they, they weren't drunk. They, they they just had a couple of drinks. Anyway." Um, the outcome of it was that Bobby Moore and Jimmy were both dropped and Alf Ramsey dropped Bobby from his England team. And uh, G- Jimmy was so upset, he vowed he would he would quit at the end of that season. And so, in the meantime, because he'd lost his love for the game, he turned to the bottle. 
and uh, he had five lost years when he became an alcoholic and um, I was very close to Jimmy and it was horrible to, to watch because if, if you know anybody with, with the drink problem uh, I mean you, you couldn't talk any sense to him mm. and uh, and I was at a funeral of a, a mutual friend of ours and, and Jimmy got along off, after it was the the week after a story appeared in the Sunday People that booze was, was killing Jimmy. And Jimmy, Jimmy had been found in a, a mental home in Worley, near, near where he lived. And uh, we were standing at the graveside, and, and Jimmy said to the coffin, which is containing a journalist pal of mine called Vic Railton, he said, Vic, be seeing you soon, son, just as the, uh, the coffin's about to be lowered. And... Uh, I, I took Jimmy for a coffee after. I said, Jim, what's that bollocks about? You, you'll be seeing him soon. He said, well, I'm fucking fed up, Norman. He said, I'm, I, I want to give up. I said, but, I said, rather than that, how, how about you and I writing a book about, about your problem, Sh- sharing it with the public, and it will put you on show, and uh, perhaps it'll help you kick, 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 kick the bloody bottle. Yeah, he said, if you want, if you want to, let, let, let's have a go. And he sat on my couch. I lived in a place called Thorpe Bay in Essex at the time. He sat on my couch for a month. And I interviewed him and, and I'm getting it all, all down on paper. And it turned out that I was, I was without meaning to be, I've become a sort of psychiatrist. And uh, he, gave, he, he unloaded everything on me. And I wrote it. There's a book called This One's On Me. And if you can get hold yeah. of a copy. I mean, it's... Um, he really opened Classic. his heart and soul, it, and, it, and it was an inc- incredible book. And uh, no, not not because I wrote it, because Jimmy spoke it. It was fantastic. And uh, as we finished the book, I said, to "Jim, I, I said uh, I want to make a proposal to you." And my, my lovely late wife Eileen was, was making us copious co- cups of coffee. I said, "I raised my co- coffee cup." I said, hey, "Ready? I'm going to." Um, Make a toast. Let's go and get sober out of our minds. You know, I was a Fleet Street drinker at the time. So we drank, and, and neither of us touched another alcoholic drink since then. And then oh, and then I got Jimmy a job on the, on the Sun, doing a column with the Sun. I, I ghosted it, and it was an incredible column. Central Television noticed, I mean, he's outspoken. Central Television signed him up. I, I had a good pal... Um, at uh, TVAM back in those days called Greg Dyke who, who ran the place and I said uh, mm-hmm. what, what chance of Jimmy Greaves to join you as um, as your football man he said no I said I've already signed a football man he said what do you know about television and he said, oh, he said to Jimmy Jimmy what, what do you know about television and Jimmy said, well, he said well, I'll watch it he said good enough he said you'll become a TV man and so he became the TV critic for TVAM and and Jimmy was dyslexic, so he couldn't read an auto cue. So everything he was saying was coming fresh off his head, and it was fantastic stuff. He said the Saint and Greasy thing. He, he, the, the Saint did all the reading, and, and Jimmy was doing all the ad libs, and it was fantastic. And and so from being a, a drunk, ready to follow his our old pal into, into the grave, he, he picked himself up. And I, I can't claim any credit for it. It was all Jimmy. It was unbelievable. And uh, Irene, meantime, uh, uh, his lovely wife, she, mm. she divorced him to try and bring him to his senses because he had four wonderful kids who he loved. Mm. And he thought, bloody hell, if I, if, I, if I don't kick the bottle, I'm not going to be allowed to see the kids. So that was his main motivation mm. there. Then, then he's got his television career taken off. Shroom, unbelievable. And then what does he do? Uh, ITV lose a license to um, show football to to Sky mm. and, and and Jimmy's <laughs> Jimmy's kicked out and he's phoned me up he said hey Norm he said uh, he said I, I, with uh, the Saint and I we've got um, we've been offered a job at Sky I said blimey Jim that's a good story can, can I use it he said yeah he said, he said it's got one problem he said the Saint he said the Saint doesn't want to put the aerials up <laughs> <laughs> I said, "You bastard!" Anyway, what, 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 what do you do next minute? Terry Terry Baker, a, a lovely guy um, who had become pally with the. It, it is, uh, he says to Jim, he said, you, you, "You should, you know, you're such a good raconteur." He said, "You should be touring the theatres," and so he then becomes a, 
the best stand-up com- comic in the country. I don't know if you ever saw him, but his stand-up act was unbelievable. <laughs> and uh, I mean, J- J- Jim- Jimmy was the great entertainer. No, that's where I think I'd like to leave this interview. Think of Jimmy as a great yeah. entertainer, and he yeah. and he and Gilly together were the Nuriev and Najinsky of, of football. I mean, they, they were fantastic together, and uh, I was, yeah. I'm very privileged and uh, and, gr- and grateful that I, I saw them at their peak. Yeah. Well, Norman, I want just like to fun- say that. Well, just, just before, I just want one thing yeah. before we finish off, Norman. I think it's only fitting to say that you were actually uh, read Jimmy's eulogy. At the at his funeral in 2021, yeah, I spoke his eulogy. My best line was uh, Jimmy would have loved. I said, uh, Jim, you, you've um, you always got um, deadly in the box and never deadlier than today. <laughs> <laughs> and that, 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 I don't know, Jimmy would have laughed loud at that one, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Norman, that's... yeah, I, I, I just want to say, I'm um, I on behalf of myself and like Philip, but for me, this has been a real honor. This has been probably one of the bits of my life. I've ticked a box. This is one of my, this is one of my, um, um, yeah, it's probably one of the greatest nights of my life doing this. And it's been a glory, glory. <laughs> got it, there we go. He's off again. Yeah. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Glory, hallelujah, and the spurs go marching on. Thank you, Norman. Everyone, thanks for having me. Thank you, Norman. No, thank you. Thank you. And that it's was brilliant. The, that was the Cockle Clock podcast. There's something in the chat, that. Norman, that tries to put me off right, rudely, right? And every time he does, so I'm glad he, this was pre recorded not live, because he would have put me off three or four times by saying that. But that was it, because we are, this will be going out tomorrow, or well, you'll be watching it now, but it's been going up on Spotify as well, on our Spotify channel. Um, Philip, we're back on Wednesday at four o'clock with Newsbeat and all the build-up to Tottenham versus Chelsea. Um, Norman, what's your score prediction for Monday? For Tottenham, Chelsea. I, ne- I, ne- I never ever make predictions who so I put the curse on people. But uh, I, yeah. I hope M- Mauricio has a great welcome. But I also hope he feels very really sad when he leaves. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I love Mar- I love exactly. Mauricio. I've, he's a wonderful man. Yeah. But, but on uh, that I, bombshell, <laughs> <laughs> on that bombshell, we'll leave the podcast there. <laughs> Philip, thank you so much for joining me. Well. And Norman, <laughs> it's been an honour. It really has. You are a Absolute legend. Absolute honour. You man. really are, sir. You're and ready. don't forget, and get over to normangillerbooks.com back. and buy that yeah. book. Yeah. Will you come back on again and, and visit us again, will you, in the future? Yeah, yes. We can talk about the push and run team. I would love that. Love well, I would, love that. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. I would love that. Well, for thank the, you, do Norman. you want to send this out? Go on. God bless. Yeah, just, God. Norman, again, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Uh, I'm a big fan of your books. I think you're the, the living legend of Spurs fans. Literally, there is no one knows Spurs better than you. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you, and uh, thank you. Keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. It's your time. Championship in the Come, next on, couple you years. Come on, Come you Spurs! Come on, you Spurs! In Come Big Ange, we trust. We <laughs> Big never Ange, we trust. Stop. <laughs> Here we go. Right, I'm going to play it now for the. There we go. And that is, and let me just take you out there. That is the great Norman Giller. Honestly, Philip, I, 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 I I'm dumbstruck. I am. I'm never usually lost for words. Derval knows. Mm. I am never lost for words. I was start. Derval turned around to me. I had to come off. She said, "I need to talk to you, Derval." I said, "What's that?" She says, "You look. You and Philip look starstruck." We are. We are. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, it, it that's, was, that's living history. That's living history. Yeah. Did Did you feel, Philip? It's one of them boxes you've ticked today. You think, yeah, that absolutely. is a good day. Absolutely. And, for, more you know, for you, I just, think, it, for me. More for you than ah, me. No, it's, ah, no, no, I think all Spurs fans. I mean, I, I hope that this will be seen by an awful lot of Spurs fans who will, yeah, might so. not have known a lot of the stuff we talked about tonight, yeah. but they'll soon learn once they hear Norman talking. Yeah. I, I'm stuff. sorry about talking about Brian Clough and Bill Shatt. I just no, wanted to pick I, no, that man's was, brain. The boxing, thing, the boxing thing was brilliant. Yeah. It was just showing the said guy's to, knowledge of the sport. I, I'd said to Devil, if I'm like that when I'm that gentleman's age, I'd be really happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But oh, on brilliant. that bombshell, on Dermot turning old and Philip getting younger, we're going to leave it there. We're back on Wednesday Oof. at four o'clock. Awesome. 
Bosn. Bosn. Um, I want to talk to ask you something off air, Philip. I have an idea. I've had a. I've just had a light bulb go off in my head. Right. So I we'll was thinking in ex- a minute. the exit there, and we're talking about that. Right. Yeah. On that, John. Come on, you Spurs. In Big Andrew, we trust. We never stop. Yeah.